Hey, hey, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Jamie from the Flow Genome Project. Um, we are basically going to take a look at where does the information come from in altered states of consciousness. Okay, so we just talked about the old school. It was a supernatural thing, but it might just be kind of super hyphen natural. It might just be an, ex an enhanced state of awareness that we don't normally have access to, and it feels so unusual and so potent that when we get there, um, it's like, oh my gosh, it couldn't be me. Um, it has to be something beyond myself. But level one. Level one is just fundamentally, this is kind of like basically rational materialist neuroscience explanation. So in general, when we're waking, when you guys are watching this, right, we have about 120 bits a second of conscious processing bandwidth. And you are using 60 bits, so about half of it, just to hear me talk. If you were also checking out a computer, if you were also watching something on another screen, you might be close to maxed out on what we can consciously process at any given time. That's why phone numbers are typically seven digits, all those kind of things. We're actually incredibly, incredibly small waking conscious memories. Now, when we get into altered states, whether through meditation, mystical states, movement, action sports, psychedelics, whatever it is, you know, uh, smart tech, you know, with electrodes and current or, or magnetic pulses, any of those things, it doesn't really matter what method we use. Once we get into those states, you have a heightening of norepinephrine, pay attention, a shot of adrenaline, a heightening of dopamine, which is basically not just a reward chemical, it's a salience signal. And salience just means this is relevant. Salience could mean there's that snarling saber-toothed tiger, or there's that beautiful woman in the bikini, or there's that wonderful double chocolate cream pie. It doesn't really matter which way it goes. It's just pay attention now. And then there's anandamide, which is that endogenous, is that endocannabinoid, right? The ingredients in THC or cannabis. Um, and that increases well sense of well-being, but also lateral thinking. So if you just take the fact that our prefrontal cortex, which is normally, that's our normal inner monologue, goes quiet, so we have, we're, we're perceiving more. We're not discarding so much at the door. Like our gatekeeper, our bouncer, is not at the front of the club anymore. So we, uh, more information is just coming in. The neurochemicals are making us pay more attention, see more connections, and make more lateral leaps, right? And our focus is driven into the now, which means rather than half daydreaming about what did happen, half fantasizing about what's gonna happen, all of my attention, even of that 120 bits, is actually here. That alone gives us enough of a bump up, right? Enough of a shift in perspective to go from 120 bits a second to, and again, this is not actual, but it just as a comparison, our retinas, right? Just what's happening in our eyes, processing up to 11 million bits a second. So you get from 120 to 11 million. That's not to say we go all the way to 11 million with our, with our processing, but it is to say there is a lot of information that we don't normally focus on and pay attention to that in an altered state because of the neurochemistry and because of what's happening in our brains and because of what's happening in our focus can actually kick us into a massively accelerated state cool so that's level one that's kind of like the reductionist materialist argument and you don't really need to go beyond that. That's the one that we would, we would advance when we're in big corporations and we're talking about this stuff and you don't know kind of your audience, how far down the rabbit hole they're interested or willing to go. And you can just kind of say, hey, even if you just accept that, um, you're going from hundreds of things to millions of things and we get to pay more attention along the way. That can f used to feel supernatural. Now it's just a super hyphen natural move. Awesome. Okay. The next level would be, is there something else about that information other than just paying more attention, right? Paying more attention to the bitstream. And to, to, you know, to take this next step, you kind of need to know sort of a couple of thought experiments, which is do we have more information inside us? Is there a certain sense of intrinsic knowing or knowledge that in an altered state of consciousness we have better or clearer access to than we normally do? And, and you know, I think it's, it's at least worth considering because certainly one of the most consistent subjective feelings, how does it actually feel to be in an altered state, tends to have it. There's this phrase that the Greeks had, which was anamnesis, right? Which is fundamentally, uh, which it means, it's the opposite of amnesia and it means the forgetting of the forgetting or a sense of deep remembering. And one of the things that people consistently report, all the way back from William James at Harvard back in the 19th century, is this almost sense of deja vu. Like, oh, when you get to that level of information in an altered state, there's that sense of the moment you glimpse it, you're like, oh yeah, I remember this. 
I remember this. So the question is why? Well, why, did, why do we have that weird feeling of deep familiarity and almost picking right back up where we left off, almost like we're sort of narcoleptic um, in, 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 our, in, our own, in our own sort of development or, or com inner conversation? So one thing you could say is take a couple of these studies, right? There's been some really fascinating studies on epigenetics in the last few years, and, uh, and I'll share with, them, share with you a couple of them. One was on rats, um, always giant caveat, not everything that happens for rats also happens to people, but one of the things that they did that was really interesting was basically do a little Pavlovian conditioning, so a sort of a shock, like avert aver aversive condition is this sort of fancy term for it, but basically you zap a rat with a shock, like ring a bell, zap a rat, see what happens, ring a bell, zap a rat, and then have two more generations of those rats. So now you've got the, the poor traumatized rat's grandkid, and you ring the bell, and they flinch even though there's no shock. And so they relatively convincingly were demonstrating that trauma can be passed down epigenetically, which means here's my genes, my DNA, and then epigenetic is just how are they expressed based on environmental conditions. So because of a traumatic experience two generations upstream, that then baby rat was also traumatized. And some folks have also done comparable studies with post Holocaust Jewish families and have been advancing a similar notion, which is that if a family or, you know, yeah, basically a, a nuclear family or a biological family has gone through intense trauma, that it can kick downstream and still effectively live in the brain's bodies and, and genetic expression of descendants. And just to, you know, pull that out of rat land um, and say, okay, now another interesting one was a study of Scandinavian, like northern Scandinavian villages who had really strangely robustly healthful males in the sort of 45 to 55 range. And they didn't know why. And they were checking, is it, you know, is it like Okinawan diet kind of stuff? Is it, what, what are they doing out there that they're living so well? And they finally traced it all back to grandfathers who had experienced periods of famine from a very specific time, from age 12 to 15, so essentially when their grandfathers were hitting puberty, i.e., you know, creating and formulating all of their sperm and genetic material they were ready to pass on, if they were hungry during a winter for up to like about a three-month kind of period, then paradoxically, the opposite of the rats, where the rat's trauma was actually kicked down the road and passed on, instead, famine, if grandpa went hungry as a skinny little kid, the grandsons were super robust with cardiovascular health and actually lived, lived to ripe old ages. So even if you just take those two examples, you're like, okay, this is fascinating. The experience of a singular human individual can pass on an actual lived experience, either psychological, I mean, if we you know, grant, grant the rats you know, <laughs> the luxury of, of mind, of, of a concept of mind, or physiological in the case of the Scandinavian study. So now you're like, okay, so this is really, this is interesting. Individual experiences can be passed on through multiple generations and they can show up in our bodies and our minds. So then you think, okay, what about all my ancestors? What about the entire evolutionary history of our species or race or whatever bucket you want to kind of just smaller or larger um, lens you want to lay over this? Wouldn't it also be plausible? In fact, you almost think it would have to be that we also do have some encoded ancestral knowledge or information. If a single grandpa going hungry for three months can show up in a measurable way. So then you think, okay, so that could be another set of information that's in us that we have access to in an altered state, in a non-ordinary state of consciousness, so not my waking rational self, but just in sort of a sensing, thinking, perceiving way, am I able to tap into that in a more interesting manner? And then if you want to take that, you know, so you can, again, you can timestamp that and you say, huh, okay, I'm willing to consider that. That might be, in addition to just perceiving more of what's around me, the kind of bits, the you know, bit processing of hundreds to millions, you can then say, okay, now is there something in my epigenetic expression in my genetic code? So click on that another level. So we've, all, we've just talked about people in my bloodline, effectively. Very straightforward and very kind of concrete how the information would have got to me. Okay, now you can take another thing and say, okay, what is in our DNA? We are all organic carbon-based life forms, and DNA is nothing but a binary information strand. Right? In fact, I think I read last month that they are now able to store something like a million copies of a movie on a single strand of DNA, something absurd that I really can't wrap my head around still. But the idea is not only does DNA do what it's always done, but that now we're learning to tinker with it and engineer it. 
so that we can actually encode additional information in the forms of binary information, zeros and ones, that in, our case, in this case could show up as movies, sound and video, but that clearly the DNA strands are all there as well. And the question is, is okay, we're carbon-based life forms. Where did all of our minerals, right? Where did this all come from? It all came from like the earth was just a rock until it got bombarded with asteroids, right? And other, other space junk slamming into us and bringing the minerals, the elements, Right, and, and arguably the spark of life. For, you know, Fr uh, Francis Crick, right, the half of the, the Nobel Prize winning team, Watson and Crick, who came up with the DNA hyper, the double helix in the first place, right, had his notion of the panspermia hypothesis, the idea that somewhere out from out of here came life to this planet. And that doesn't mean some grand mythological narrative, that just means this was just a rock of, you know, just a ball of dust, rock and ice until stuff, star stuff, slammed into it. So you're like, okay, and we are made of that stuff. So if we can if we can experience epigenetically, right, the DNA expression, the genetic expression of grandpa, and maybe my great 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 grandpa, and maybe all my great great grandpas and grandmas and everybody else, and that same DNA is just binary encoded information strands that originated, right, in the Big Bang, fundamentally, if you chase it that far back, then you're like, oh my god, we have the entire history of the universe encoded in our actual cellular matter and that's really like material it's there's nothing metaphysical about it at all and the only question is is do we have the skeleton key of unlocking that information right so that's the kind of far end of the level two hypothesis level one was just we're paying more attention to what's going on around us meaningfully more exponentially more level two is we're actually almost able to look within ourselves and encoded within ourselves Right, is, you know, depending on which level of the thought experiment you're willing to engage, right, is a pile more, ultimately, potentially, infinitely more information. And then the third one, and the third one, funnily enough, is not one I've even entertained. Like, I'm more than happy just trying to wrap my head around level two. <laughs> but there are people, um, in David Eagleman, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, you know, um, famous and accomplished neuroscientists, is also a friend and advisory board member to the Flow Genome Project. Is um, his idea is that you know the idea of the, what's the relationship between brain and mind is is it possible that our brains and our bodies are fundamentally like the radio, the radio set, the receiver, you know, and that what and what gets played through that speaker is fundamentally signal from someplace else. And, you know, so that's a highly credible neuroscientist advancing that case. Once you get into that territory where you say, hey, <clears throat> we are instruments and we are, we are receiving, perceiving, decoding, whatever verb you want to give it, um, information that exists above and beyond us, then you've, al then you've almost kind of come back full circle to a potentially metaphysical explanation in the sense that Right, Plato originally said it was the realm of ideal forms, like up there, there was this perfect chair, there was this perfect apple, there was this perfect everything. And we just occasionally tap into it and we can perceive it. Um, Tila de Chardin called it the nuosphere, right? This realm, not just the ecosphere, right? But this realm of mind that was sort of shared. More recently and controversially, Rupert Sheldrake you know, named it sort of the idea of morphogenetic fields, you know, the idea of almost like literally like different animals tuning into the radio stations or different radio stations. So it's almost interesting, I think, that, that David Eagleman has kind of come back around to at least posit something in that neck of the woods, but from a really research-based scientific perspective. So without having to kind of go off the deep end in any particular direction, we can begin to wonder, hey, that sense of anamnesis, that sense of forgetting our forgetting, of remembering what we've always known, and it feeling like deja vu, it feeling super familiar, and absolutely our own knowledge, right? Then the question is, is like, well, where is it all coming from? So hopefully these three, um, these three categories kind of give, give us permission to think a little bit more clearly about it. We don't have to just jump into quasi-mystical explanations. You can, you're welcome to if you want to. Um, our interest, our preference um, at Flow Genome Project is always to kind of stay content neutral, which is let's give people mechanisms for thinking about this stuff for themselves and then have them go conduct their own experiments rather than saying this is the way things are, right? Because it's highly unlikely. The moment we try and stop 
um, stop the you know the slot machine uh, of of the universe from spinning all its possibilities and say that and that alone is we're, we're almost certainly going to be false in some shape or form. So we'd rather say, hey, here's some things to check out. So my question is, is um, what do you guys think? And which of those explanations, the kind of level one reduction materialists, we're just paying more attention to real data around us. Level two. We're gaining access to some form of information encoded in us, epigenetically, genetically, at the level of DNA, and potentially all the way down to the level of the fundamental elements of, our, of, you know, of this planet and, and the universe we live in, the solar system. Um, or level three, we're more instruments, and we're actually tuning into an information layer that is kind of above and beyond us and distinct from us, but just sometimes we get to, we get to tune into it. So, Mo, you've got one. You said, this is gnosis, what I would like to call DNA gnosis. Self-knowledge through introspection leads to self-enfoldment. Interesting. Self-enfoldment through extrospection, looking outwards. Okay, nice, nicely said. Nicely said. Yeah, so um, just so everybody else uh, understands the, the language there, gnosis is typically described as the experience of deep, true knowing. Um, and so the idea of DNA gnosis could be, in fact, yeah, the information's inside us. And when we unlock it, uh, particularly from getting out of our normal waking states, uh, that we can have access to it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a great one. Um, Maria uh, is just asking, what happens when you tap into the realm of mind? Well, I mean, I think this is the beautiful thing. Right, is what happens when any of us tap into the realm of our minds is what is happening in the realm of our minds. And it's unique and different. And um, I think as much as I'd love to start saying, hey, provisionally this is what seems to happen in most senses, et cetera, I think we just need more people conducting this experiment. And when I say this experiment, what I'm meaning is um, finding skillful means to access peak states um, relatively often, taking level-headed notes, not jumping to premature interpretations and explanations, and continuing to kind of cautiously, skeptically, but with open hearts and minds, um, map the terrain we're all finding. And, you know, I was, I was talking with Jason Silver last week, and we were just kind of riffing on this, but the sort of a fairly neat little equation came up, which is ecstasis, right, those moments of stepping beyond ourself, plus catharsis, the actual mending of what's broken, equals gnosis, equals that ineffable sense of, yes, I'm tapped into that information field. I am both seeing more and fixing more. And if I go back and forth between the high peak experience and the work it shows me is still to be done in the valley, then I end up with gnosis or apotheosis or whatever you'd like to call it. And so to that, that's as far as I'm comfortable going out on the limb of making meaning for other people. Um, but what we would just say is just go conduct the experiment, go see. Um, and interestingly enough, that's how like first century Christianity was. Like back when it was just a handful of folks gathered around the teachings of the Nazarene and the apostles, they were like, okay, we know who we are because everybody's on fire, literally. Like they're, you know, by their, by their fruits, ye shall know them. And women were able to be priests. There was, you know, art, music, all kinds. It was a wild ass underground scene. I mean, it was far closer to like the Burning Man culture today than stuffy lockdown Orthodox churches by the Middle Ages, right? And it went, and there was actually a battle. If anybody's interested in this, it was a National Book Award or Pulitzer Prize winning book award um, of, called uh, The Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels at Princeton. Um, so it was in the mid 70s the book came out, but it was the translation of the Nag Hammadi scrolls, which had come out of Egypt uh, and, and Oxford University in the 50s. And it's fascinating because you realize, oh, wow, so that's an early Gnostic tradition. And it really just came down to a tug of war between the bureaucrats and the ecstatics. And the bureaucrats won because the ecstatics said, look, the only people that are truly Christians, like they have a light in their eyes. We know them, you know, like the brothers and sisters. We can tell. We can tell how they sing, how they dance, how they move, how they pray. Right. We can tell. And then Paul and the bureaucrats were like, hey, no, 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 let everybody in and pass the collection plate. So let's build, let's grow an organization and let's do it with revenue and numbers. And that was the fork in the road. So we could have had a radically different history of Western Europe and everything else had only 
the ecstatics um, prevail. But here's, this is the same, you know, this is the same conundrum that prompted us to form Flow Genome Project in the first place, which is the people who are really good at having ecstatic experiences have very little interest in studying them generally. And the people that are interested in studying them are rarely any good at having them. <laughs> so you end up with this split by the people who are documenting it. Usually, I mean, I mean, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, God bless him, right? Was re you know the, the Godfather of flow was renowned for being one of the dullest lecturers on the planet. And you think, now how is that? How is that? And then who are the best flow heads? They're, they're these you know twelve year old little surfer grommets hanging out in Hawaii. Um, so so those are always the paradoxes of seeking these states. And I think what is hopefully different and what's really exciting about today, like right now, is that it's no longer uh, a kind of a bohemian or hippie tune in, turn on, drop out, or a surf bum, ski bum kind of thing. We've got more and more people who are fiercely committed to their work in the world, but who are also skillfully accessing peak states and using that information really deliberately to bring it back put it on the ground in practical applications. So I will leave you guys with one final thought, which is just this idea of um, <laughs> the cultural assumptions that, uh, that sort of support or prevent us from tuning into more of this information more often. And anthropologists basically lump societies into two different buckets. Um, as far as how they perceive inf the information layer. One is a monophasic society, literally mono meaning one, phase meaning you know, f you know, basically the channel they tune into. So a single channel society. And you can make a case that us and the Western rational materialist West are a monophasic society. In the past, most indigenous traditions were polyphasic. They actually grooved on a lot of different channels. So whether it was trance or possession or dreams or visions or omens, right? There was all these other things that could happen in their world. And that information that came from those things, they took dead seriously. They took as valid or even as more valid than waking state perception and apprehension. So when you have, you know, when you have Nietzsche saying God is dead, right, he was basically speaking to a realm of like the triumph of the ego and the intellect over superstition and mysticism. Well, what's, and, and, and we rightly said there's a lot of superstition and mysticism in that stuff. There's a lot of just hocus pocus. But we also killed our access to multiple channels. So where we stand today is on the verge of being able to come up to not an irrational polyphasic society, meaning we're just magical thinking and superstitious, but we're listening to everything, um, into instead a post-rational polyphasic society, meaning we still keep our wits about us, that's still the rational part, but we're also going beyond that single channel of rational information perception into a multi-channel realm and culture. So I'll leave you guys with that. The notion there would be, um, what is it like to start cultivating for ourselves, then each other, and then broader and broader groups, a post-rational polyphasic culture that lets us access and act on the information, the inspiration, and if we're really doing our homework, the transformation that results from more data from more places.